Welcome to another season of Digging Deeper, a podcast of Perimeter Church in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Senior Pastor Jeff Norris here with my co-host, Laura Story Elvington, and we're excited to be back in your earbuds and your streaming platforms. But we're changing things up just a little bit for this short four-week mini-series that we're calling Unshakable. We're going to be sitting down with four different guests as they share their stories of how walking through a shaky season of life has further revealed the unshakable character of God. And we pray that you'll both find hope and encouragement in these testimonies as you're drawn back to the truth of God's unshakable character in whatever season of life you may be walking through. So let's dig in. We are here with Jennifer Rothschild and uh, so thrilled to have this conversation with her. Uh, Laura and I joined um, as usual by just extraordinary guests on this podcast uh, that we get to ask questions to and hear their story. And this is a new series that we're doing that you just heard about called Unshakable. And uh, we're kind of um, using that title a little bit juxtaposed against being shaken. And so all of us have experienced things in our lives where we have felt shaken. Some of us sometimes shaken to the core and not knowing exactly what our next steps will be. Yet in that, we experience the reality of our unshakable God and his unshakable kingdom as Hebrews teaches us. And so, Jennifer, thank you so, so much for joining us and for being willing to share your story and your insight with us today. Well, I am so happy I get to be here because uh, Laura's story knows this because I'm not shy about it. I tell her she is one of my favorite people on the whole planet. <laughs> so now that I know, like, you are the pastor of her church and y'all are friends, like, we are, we're like this We're now. We're best like, friends now. We're all time. Yes. yes, we are. Yes, well, yes I am, we are. I am absolutely giddy that we get to talk to Jennifer because when we began to talk about just the idea for this, for this uh, series, she was the first literally the first person that came to mind. I remember you saying yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Just because of your story, because of your life, because of your ministry. So I am just thrilled th- that this is happening. Me too. Right back at you. Me too. Yep. And yep. Jennifer, I got to tell you, so um, I was just watching some videos last night of you that are that I found online, and I was so deeply encouraged. And it was so fun to see that you were on the Today Show, I think earlier this year, right? Yeah, well, it was a couple of years ago. Oh, was it? Yes, okay. I was. Mm-hmm. Um, I think actually Kathy Lee was still on the show and she is retired now. So like mm. once she was finished with me, she's like, I'm done. I'm done at all. That's right. <laughs> she really. achieved Not everything really. to be achieved. <laughs> by interviewing yeah, you. right. Yes. No, right, it was awesome. Right. It was so encouraging. Yeah. And I could tell they just loved hearing from you and your story. And um, the video thing montage that they had of you and your story was so good. So anyway, our people are listening now uh gonna get to hear some of that but I'm, yeah i'm just picturing you watching uh kathy lee and Hoda. <laughs> <laughs> i have that to say right that's there, not part it? of my normal routine but <laughs> but it was really good it was really good that's awesome well it was a privilege it really was thank you for saying that because it was it was an honor that i got to do that yeah so all right we're gonna jump in um mm-hmm. with this theme of shaken and and then god's unshakable kingdom um tell us your story what 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 is it about your story and background uh, where you experienced uh, the shakenness of this fallen world and um, and how you've seen the Lord in that? You know, when you ask that question, I can't I can't help but think of that old song. There's a whole lot of shaking going on, you know, <laughs> right? Um, and it shows up in our lives in different ways. So I will tell you my initial like what hit like a 10 on the Richter scale for me was when I was 15 years old. And in fact, as I kind of share this with you, let me just say this right up front, and this will make sense in a few minutes. You know, I'm sitting here in front of a camera, thousands of miles away from y'all, and I may not be looking into the camera the whole time. Hmm. And so I just want you to know if my eyes wander, my heart is looking straight at <laughs> you <laughs> as we're listening to this and watching this. But there's a reason my eyes may not be looking straight into the camera. So I just want us all to get real comfy right up front with that. When I was 15, uh, I was diagnosed with a disease in both of my eyes called retinitis pigmentosa. And um, mm-hmm. this was like out of the blue. There was no family history that we were aware of. And it's interesting how it first showed up because I was like a normal teenager doing all the things. In fact, my favorite thing was art. Like I love to mm. draw. 
And like, if I could see y'all right now, I would be studying your faces, um, trying to, ex you know, then do a, a rendering, a visual rendering, a caricature uh, to try to capture your faces and capture your personality in those faces. So that was my thing. Cartooning, caricatures was my favorite thing ever. Mm. And I was decent at it um, to the extent that like I had a reputation in my school that I was the artist. Like if you needed something created, they, I was the go-to girl. And so that's really when a problem with my eye began to show up at first because I was creating a banner for field day, like on this huge white bed sheet. Hmm. Um, because, you know, we were going to hold it up to lead us on to victory. And I was creating this lion in the middle of the bed sheet. Um, and as I was really focusing on that bright white bed sheet and drawing this lion, I noticed it looked like the sheet was dirty. And, you know, and I kept trying to mark, wipe the marks away and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't figure out why the sheet was dirty. And when I said that to my friend who was helping me, she said, wait a minute, this is totally white. I don't know what you're seeing there. Well... I mean, you can imagine that was the first mm. step into me realizing, uh oh. So if I fast forward my story just a little bit, um, I ended up in an eye hospital after sharing this with my mother. And after days of testing at the eye hospital, that's when the doctors diagnosed that this disease was present in both my eyes. And what I was actually seeing when I was thought my bed sheet was dirty that I was trying to draw on um, was actually parts of my retina. Mm -hmm. that were floating off into my eye. And so I was seeing those black marks and what looked like eraser dust. So you can imagine at age 15 to get a diagnosis mm -hmm. um, right then of this disease, retinitis pigmentosa, which caused legal blindness immediately. Mm -hmm. Yet the prognosis was total blindness. I mean, that's like a shaking oh that you don't even know how yeah. to put words to yeah. when you're 15. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just thinking about my, one of my daughters, I have three daughters, one son, and one of my daughters just turned 15. And mm. just thinking Gosh. about, you know, her life right now and all that she's involved in and thinking about what, how much it would shake our world if, if something like what you're, what you experienced hit her. And I don't even know how to begin to even process that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that's my next question. How did you, I mean, do you remember at, yeah. at that age, what was going through your mind? What was, were you already a follower of Christ at that point? And how did you initially react? I mean, I can, I can guess how you probably initially react, but reacted, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. What were, what were the things that were, you were experiencing in your heart and mind at that point? You know, that's such a good question because sometimes I think, especially as Christ followers, which I was, I was born again. I was a believer in Christ. I had been for about uh, five years at that point. Um, sometimes we think we have to have an automatic, hallmark-worthy, Hobby Lobby kind of piece of art-worthy, you know, response. Mm -hmm. Like, it is well with my soul, done, yeah. moving on. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's so not true, because part of anything that shakes us is we feel the, um, the constant effects of that shaking. Yeah. And it not only shakes us up, but it shakes up our world, our people, our worldview, the whole, the whole thing. And so I do believe looking back, I'm not sure exactly um, how I processed it completely because of, I think there were a couple of things that were happening. One, we're in Christ. When the scripture talks about God's grace being sufficient, mm -hmm. there's a sufficiency of grace. I think we don't even recognize. And yes, it's for salvation. Yes, mm -hmm. it's for our sustenance. But it's also to deal with this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think he absorbed. I think God's grace absorbed a lot of this for me so that I didn't even recognize what I was processing. Mm. I think a secondary way um, that I was processing this, because I was stunned, <laughs> and I don't know how long that shock lasted, but because I was stunned, I think I looked immediately as a teenager to my parents. Yeah. Because I did not have within me the wherewithal or this emotional warehouse from which I could go to, you know, to draw from, to know how to respond. Um, and so I think I watched my parents. And until it became um, real for me, I copied them. Mm -hmm. So if they showed faith and trust, that's what I showed. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I think that helps us know, even as parents or as young people, wherever we are in our journey, that we help each other know how to respond. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes if we don't have it within ourselves, we look to someone else. And so I can also give you a couple of examples of that, okay? Um, the last book that I ever read, before I realized it would be the last book I ever read, okay? Mm -hmm. So that summer before I uh, turned 15, it was my um, 10th grade year. That summer, I read a couple of books. And the very last book I read was um, Johnny Erickson Tata's, mm. well, she wasn't Tata then, Johnny Erickson's um, autobiography. Mm. And it was simply called Johnny. And she was, um, I'm sh I would assume a lot of your listeners and viewers and know who she is, but just in case, um, when she was 17, she was in a diabetes accident, became a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. She is one of the most amazing women. I mean, we could stop right now and just talk the rest of the time about her and be totally blessed, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I read her story with these eyes that could actually see at that point and um, had no idea Wow. that her story would be the last book I would ever read. Goodness. And literally God tucked her story and her life into my heart and she became a hero for me. And there were times early in blindness, I didn't know how to react. And I would remember scenes from Johnny's story mm. and I would imitate her. Hmm. I mean, Gosh. I think the pressure's <laughs> off for us when we're in the family of God, we just follow him to the best of our ability. We have no idea how that fellowship is going to affect someone else. Mm. So I'm so thankful for that. And and of course it became my own, of course it did. Um, and I'm so thankful through God's grace that that faith and tenacity and perseverance became my own because I, I did love Jesus. I really did. I loved him and mm. I needed him. Gosh. Oh, wow. I'm just gonna say, and then I'm gonna yeah, let you, go ahead. It, it just makes me think of Paul, when he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And right? um, mm -hmm. the beauty of that, right? Sometimes you can go, wow, that sounds arrogant, Paul. But it wasn't arrogant at all. It was, <laughs> I'm pursuing Jesus. And some of you need to see that so that you can mimic it as well. So anyway, yeah, yeah I, know you, I know you're- No, you're, I uh, so many comments, so yeah, many questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jennifer, I've told you this before, but you, you and Johnny, the two of you guys have been such- heroes and examples to my husband and I if we, as he if, as we've walked through uh, his limitations and disability and so how uh, that's just so beautiful to hear so high school what what happened next because I I'm like on the edge of my seat wanting to tell people about how <laughs> God has is using you now and using <laughs> yeah. your story now but but fill in the gaps from then till now so I graduated from high school and I learned to walk with a cane that summer. I got a mobility instructor because I really wanted to be independent, you know. So I, um, and, and there's many crises of moments when I thought that really wasn't such a good idea. I would rather be sheltered and stay home. But I'm so thankful for my mother's faith and tenacity that she said, you know, you, you chose to go to college. So let's go to college. You, you can do this. And I literally did. I went away from my home to Palm Beach Atlantic University mm. there in West Palm Beach, Florida, where I was a freshman. And that is where, my friends, I met this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this guy is a very big part of my story because um, I, I didn't think I was going to stay at, at college, honestly. I had a really, and I probably still do have kind of a little bit of an attitude. And I literally, I remember when I got out of the car at this dormitory, Northwood dorm, I flipped out my cane, you know, with this just enough attitude because I literally thought I'm going to stay here two weeks just to prove to my mother that I tried so she will let me come home. Well, <laughs> it was in the first two weeks I met this guy. <laughs> and I remember calling my mom within the first two weeks and saying, mom, I met this guy named Philip Rothschild. <laughs> Please don't ever make me come home from college again. And I did it. <laughs> so if you missed my name, it is Jennifer Rothschild now because I did marry that boy uh, after we graduated from college. And I share that with you because he is such a big part of my story. God can do anything with our stories, whether we're single or married. But God used Phil in my life mm. to help shape so much of what God has done with my story because, 
you know, I, here I was totally blind and um, couldn't see to drive a car. Um, I was into music at the time and I was writing songs and singing all over the state of Florida. And it was back early in the days when um, uh, people were starting to lead worship. You know, so I'd sit at the key at the piano or stand at the keyboard and lead worship at our churches. And um, but Phil had such a vision um, and more confidence in me than I ever have had in myself. Mm. And he mm. kept making a way to help open doors. Well, they were really God who was opening the doors. He just helped make a way to walk through those doors, Phil did. And so now if you fast forward through our story from the time we married to now, yes, the Lord has opened up doors of ministry through writing books and Bible studies and sharing in conferences. And it's just my joy to be able to truly give to others what God has given me. And it really has been, honestly, through his word. I like, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely, I can, I can do a lot of things without the Lord. I'm just going to be honest. I can, we all can, right? Yeah. We can pull it off for a while. There is absolutely no way that I can do blindness mm. without God and without his word. Mm -hmm. and, and really that's just a reflection of everything else that would finally fall apart too, because life can be shaky. The ground we walk on mm -hmm. shakes when we don't expect it. And if I do not have the stability of the Lord and the word, I, I yeah. will be, you know, just mm. of 10 seconds away from a total meltdown. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Laura, tell her what you told me before before she came on oh, about her I, teaching and you well, sitting I, under it. Yeah. yeah, I was just saying that uh, I can't think of a, of any woman who I've sat under their teaching as much as I've sat under your Bible teaching. And it has been the greatest blessing. And for those listening mm. who haven't done one of Jennifer's studies, just she's uh, a Bible study writer with Lifeway and, and just incredible, incredible mm. studies. Um, but kind of along those lines, what are the specific truths? And you've already mentioned some, um, but what are the specific truths that have kept you hopeful, that have kept you uh, oh, actually, let me go back a little bit. What, before I think about the truths that have kept you hopeful and joyful, what, even now, what are the temptations um, to believe about yourself, about God's plan, about mm. blindness, um, and then what are the truths that you use to combat those, those lies? Now, that's a good question um, that probably when we're finished talking, I will have a great answer <laughs> for <laughs> Because I can tell I need to ponder it more, but I will tell you this temptation, easy, comes to my mind emotionally very quickly. Um, the temptation to believe that I am a burden, mm. blindness is a burden, that it walks into the room before me and identifies me, mm. that it um, brands me as something lesser or more complicated for all my relationships. <sighs> And so um, that is a very, I call it a, de a temptation because it's so real. Mm. Yeah. And some, you know, if I share that with people who love me, they say, that is not true. Yet the feelings are true. Yeah. And, and I guess I want to be very clear about that with all of us who are being honest with each other. It is complicated to be blind and it complicates other people's lives. Does that mean it's a burden? No, that's where the temptation to believe the lie comes in. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting as I share that, that one of the things that helped me is Johnny Erickson Tata one time sharing how she asked someone to open a door for her, you know, because she's in a wheelchair. And she said, how, that's one of the ways she combats that feeling like a burden is realizing I'm actually giving this person who's helping me mm. a chance to feel esteem. Hmm. That they that's are great. esteemed by helping someone who needs help. That has helped me a lot. Now, the truth with which I combat that kind of temptation, which is probably my most constant temptation, is a twofold truth. It's the truth that I need to humble myself in the sight of the Lord. Hmm. Because sometimes when I feel like a burden to others, it's really just an, in, an inverted pride yeah. that is showing up. And, and so to humble myself before the Lord is saying, you know what, Lord, because you have allowed this in my life, I will embrace that 
which I cannot avoid. I will humble myself before you, and I will see that this thorn that you have allowed, that you haven't removed, mm -hmm. is for my good and someone else's good. Mm. Okay? So I humble myself, and I receive it one more time. Mm. And I not only receive it, but I receive everything that comes with it, which means the temptation to feel like I'm a burden when really I'm not. I'm no, I'm not because yeah. you don't create burdens. You're the burden bearer, not the burden giver. Okay. So that's one way I fight that temptation is through humility. The second is through um, kind of what I've learned from Johnny is, and I don't really necessarily have a scripture at the moment for this, but it's that, that truth that I am called to give. And so however, so whatever the generosity of giving looks like as other people are helping me, I'm going to have the humility to receive that and give. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I may feel like I am needing more than I'm giving, but I know in the spiritual economy, the Lord is using this to give to someone else. Yeah. So I need to chill out, humble myself <laughs> and just let that happen. Oh, that's so good, man. Can we just do like two hours with her? <laughs> I told you, she's yeah. great. Golly, that's so good, so good. Um, I love that phrase you used, inverted pride, mm. because I think that's, um, we can all relate to that, you know, because Can't it's really we? pride. It sounds uh, somewhat like it's a oxymoron, but it's, it's, it's pride that's rooted in insecurity mm -hmm. and we all have insecurities, right? And, and. And so much of it is rooted in, in pride as well. So, yeah, gosh, mm -hmm. um, all right. You said something. I want to. I want to go back to something you said a moment ago. And this is more just for fun. You, you, uh, you sing. You mentioned that you <laughs> used to lead worship. Yes. And I had yeah. read. She's I had, a beautiful. She has a beautiful voice. Well, oh. I had read somewhere that you actually, um, you have some albums that you have <laughs> have made over the years, right? Okay, so we need to use some definitions here. <laughs> Let's let create a lexicon for this conversation. All right. You're sitting next to someone who sings. Okay. Now, we... I'm just saying, okay, let me just brag. When Laura said that she has sat under my teaching and how much it's ministered, that's how I feel. The <laughs> anointing of the Lord in her music and just the beautiful, skillful rendering that yeah. she leads. Okay, yes. so... Listen, I would play around on the keyboard <laughs> so and funny. I sing songs and I do not want anyone to buy my albums, buy my books. They are better than my albums. <laughs> okay, go. Let's just be honest. Okay. But, um, but, but have you ever sung with Laura at one of your conferences? Oh, we do it all the yes. time. Yes. 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 Okay. But she doesn't realize it. I'm actually her backup singer. I just don't have a mic <laughs> because it would ruin the whole presentation. <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. But okay. You know what though? I'll tell you one funny piece of trivia. Because back in the day, I literally did sing all the time. Like, that's what I did. Um, you remember Lionel Harris? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. My big claim to fame was that I opened for Lionel Harris. How about it? In oh, wow. the South Florida tour. Yes, I did. That's fantastic. Oh, gosh. What was the name of the song I used to listen to all the time from him? Uh the stand or, or uh, no, not the stand. What was the name of that song? Anyway. Yeah, we, we, we could do a whole other Larnell Harris podcast. Yeah. Right. Okay, I, but here's here's what I, we're running out of time here. And there okay, are probably okay. about 20 stories that I can think of that I want Jennifer to tell. Can I make a request though? Okay, you, yes. I think um, one of the things I've loved about you and how God has used you to teach women uh, it's because your story is, uh, it doesn't have this tidy bow on it. Right. And you tell a story sometimes when you speak about being the speaker at a women's conference. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you mind sharing that story? The one about uh, mercy? Yeah, the, I, I think healing? so. Yes. 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 Okay. Because okay. I, I, I think it really sums up the way that you... Um, just have have learned to um, to be content in in mm -hmm. where God has you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was speaking at a women's conference in a part of the country. It was for a denomination that it was like their state denominational women's conference. And when I was invited, I was kind of surprised because you know they might have had a slightly different understanding of um, healing in Scripture than I did. You know, there are some. Um, people who interpret scripture that if you have enough faith, yeah. you will be healed, right? 
Well, here I am blind. It's like poster child for God doesn't always heal. But anyway, it was very cool. They invited me. So um, I get there in the first night. I share a lot of my story about blindness and that God has made it well with my sir, my soul, even though it's not well with my circumstances. Right. So I sit down and the woman in charge stands up and she says a couple of little things that I thought maybe she didn't like what I said. Okay. <laughs> there were a couple of little things, but I thought, Honestly, I thought, I'm just being insecure. Every woman listening to this understands. Like, we, we can take things way too personally. And I thought, okay, it's just me. Chill out. So next morning, I show up to speak. And I shared from Daniel 3, where, the, you know, there's these um, the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They're thrown into the fiery furnace. And God does not deliver them from that fire. But he delivers them through that fire. So I sh that's what I shared. I sat down lady in charge gets up and she's like, mm, I could tell she really did not like what I was talking about. And it was obvious then. Well, it was obvious to my friend, Karen, who was traveling with me. And so we had a break. And during this break, um, <laughs> I said to Karen, I'm a little nervous because I'm about to teach out of second Corinthians 12. And that's a passage that features this thorn in the flesh that Paul had. Yeah. It's yep. the thorn that God didn't remove, you know. And I said, sister in charge is not going to like this. I, I just know she's not going to like it. And, and so we prayed about it. It's time for me to get up and speak. And I'm like, oh, I did not. I just knew. I just knew. Anyway, so I get up and I talk about life with thorns and that God doesn't always heal, but he always gives sufficient grace. And so I sit down. And when I do, this lady who is in charge gets up. And this time it was not subtle at all. She literally said, every woman in this room deserves to be healed. If you believe you deserve to be healed, stand to your feet and show God you believe you deserve to be healed. Well, you know, women are, they have broken hearts and families and bodies and they're standing because they do long to be healed. All right. And I'm not judging them. The emotion in the room began to grow. The band gets on the stage and it's the emotions really swelling at this point. And the woman in charge repeats over and over and over this one phrase. Every woman deserves to be healed. If you believe you deserve to be healed, stand to your feet. Well, Karen and I are sitting on the front row and I say to Karen, like a ventriloquist, because I don't know who's watching. <laughs> Karen, is everyone standing? <laughs> Karen says, Everyone but us. <laughs> oh, no. And she says, I'll do what you do. And um, I remained seated. Mm. I said, I can't stand. And, and she said, I can't either. And it wasn't because I thought, well, God wouldn't heal me or um, God, I, you know, I'm Baptist or I'm Presbyterian or he only heals charismatics. <laughs> None of that nonsense. Um, it wasn't that. It was because she said, Everyone deserves mm. to be healed. If you believe you deserve to be healed, stand up. That's why I remain seated. Because I don't deserve to be healed. But moreover, I don't deserve anything from God. None of us do. Mm. None of us do. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't, we don't for, deserve peace. But we got from God what we do not deserve. Amen. This beautiful relationship with him through Christ, because mm -hmm. Jesus took for us what he didn't deserve. Mm. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what they thought of me when Karen and I finally slinked out of there. <laughs> but um, there is a beauty that comes mm. from recognizing the kindness of God. That So even if he allows us to suffer, which we think, oh, this isn't fair. We don't know what he's sparing us from. And sometimes we need to pay attention uh, that we didn't get what we actually deserved. So we thank him for all the things we did get. Wow. Mm. My goodness. <laughs> amen and amen. Amen. Gosh, that is, your joy is so contagious. Um, your love for Jesus is so contagious. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, gosh, I, I am somewhat speechless because I just am so, <laughs> I'm so blessed by what you've shared. And um, I have one last question before we let you go. I want you to speak directly to, um, and by the way, let me say, thanks for staying seated in that situation. <laughs> I think, you know, because I think the way you just worded that is what some, so many listening even need to hear because the, the teaching, I'll just go on a little bit of a soapbox here. The teaching that, 
uh, if we have enough faith, we can be healed of anything, and it's all contingent upon our faith, is, is erroneous at, be- at best, uh, and it's detrimental at worst. And Angry. it teaches us that um, it's not really about God's grace, it's about our faith, which the Bible doesn't teach at all. And does he, he will heal all of us at some point, either on this side of heaven or, uh, or once we're in glory. And so anyway, uh, just uh, I appreciate your testimony in that. Um, it, speak directly to those who are in the throes of something that has shaken them to the core right now. And, you know, it may not be I was, I'm 15 and I've experienced blindness for the rest of my life now, but something similar. And they are, their world is just turned upside down. What are some words of encouragement and truth that you would have for them? I think sometimes when um, things come into our life that, that shake us, you know, like Laura was sharing about Martin. And, mm. and there's so many of us listening right now. We, we got our things. We got all our, we've all got our things. And when it comes into our life, we think, okay, this is it. I'm not going to survive. So I'm going to give you a couple of phrases to remember. Sometimes we think that what shakes us is going to break us. Mm. But I believe God allows what shakes us to actually shape us. Mm. So we need to be patient with the process and let that shaking that is occurring in our lives be used by the hand of God to shape us into the person that he's, that he's created us to be. I think of my life with blindness and I think, with my independent streak and I got a little sassiness to me and I got all this <laughs> stuff that could so destroy me. And blindness has been a constant buffeting agent in my life that mm. he has used to shape me and in many ways protect me from myself. So look at what God is allowing in your life to shake you and recognize it's not going to break you. It's there for a greater purpose, which is to shape you. And then the other thing I guess I would I've learned the hard way and I would um, I would really lovingly challenge you to do is to take your eyes off you. Mm-hmm. Because when it's all about us, we're gonna suffer harder. Mm-hmm. I tell my children, su- selfish people suffer harder. Mm-hmm. But if we can take our eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured his cross without whining and complaining, It was for the joy set before him, even though he didn't like all the parts that went with it. If we can do that, if we consider him, as Hebrews 12 says, then we do not lose heart. But if we're only considering ourselves, this isn't what I wanted, this isn't how I thought it should be, then what does shake us will break us Mm -hmm. and and will become selfish and bitter. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, then that hard thing will shape us into the image of Christ and the less we are all about us, the happier we're going to be. Gosh, I'll tell you what I selfishly want. I selfishly, selfishly hope that uh, for my wife, Rachel, and I, that we get to uh, cross paths with you and Phil at some yeah. point and uh, get to hang with you in person and have a long dinner and just listen and, and fellowship. Because uh, in 36 minutes here, you have blessed my socks off. Mm. So yeah. thank you so Amen. much. Thank right you back so at much, you. Jennifer. Oh, we're just Love so you grateful. Guys. Love you too. Yep. Love you. So yeah, thank you so much. I told you she was so great. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> I'll tell you. So when she teaches, a uh, lot. I mean, she teaches on so many different subjects, but she has a talk that she gives on Isaiah six, mm-hmm. and it talks about um, you know this with this whole idea of of shaken um, and unshakable God, um, all of this. She talks about Isaiah being in the temple and mm. experiencing the shaking. Mm. And one of the things that she says is Isaiah is not experiencing shakiness because he's in the wrong place. He's oh, experiencing wow. it because he's in the right place. Wow. And it just is such a reminder to us mm. um, that sometimes uh, following the Lord like even with her story of being the only person not standing uh, and experiencing that, um, you know, uh, embarrassment, shame, whatever it is, it was because she was, she was standing upon the promises of God. Uh, I just have always loved what she shared and how she shares it. What a, what a profound insight 
that is, that we often think that when we're in the presence of the Lord, like Isaiah was, Mm -hmm. that uh, everything becomes unshaken in the sense of that, you know, everything just settles. And but in the yeah, just that thought of in the presence of the Lord is actually when things kind of shake in the sense of, wow, we're we're in the presence of glory and he's doing something that we're not fully Absolutely. able to see at the time and yeah. in the moment. And, and it can be terrifying. I mean, mm-hmm. Isaiah was terrified in that moment in Isaiah six. So man, what a, ble- I mean, you know, that was one of those where I look down at our clock and we always try to do 30 to 35 minutes with our guests. And it said 36 minutes and I thought it had been like 10 minutes. <laughs> and, and I, and I wanted to just keep going and, and keep hearing her stories and her insight. Um, but we can't because we have so many yeah. more great stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I am so excited about uh, just the direction of this this season of podcasts. I just think, and I know that I have been blessed by, with this time with Jennifer, and I know the stories to come will bless us yeah. and others even more. Absolutely, and I love chasing this theme of unshakable, um, in in just the way that this is framed. Uh, which, by the way total credit to you for coming up with this concept because I love it of, of talking to people about when they have felt shaken, mm-hmm. when they've experienced the shakiness of the, of the brokenness of the world around us, innocent around us and how we see the unshakable reality of the kingdom of God in that. Um, I love it. I love chasing that. So anyway, uh, stick with us. We'll be coming with more uh, episodes and uh, the next one you'll love to hear from. We're going to be talking with uh, Jeff and Katie Francoeur. So join us for episode two of Unshakable.